Welcome to today's lecture. In our lecture notes, we go today to subsection 6.2 about the Voysevich inequality. So maybe let's first uh, have a reminder on the setup in the chapter 6. So in this chapter, uh, R was a real closed field and uh, K a uh, subfield of R. Of course, on R we have a unique order, and uh, this induces an order on K. And curly SN denotes for each non-negative integer n the Boolean algebra of all K semi-algebraic subsets of R to the n. These were Boolean combinations of uh, um, of uh, sets defined by polynomial inequalities, uh, um, where the polynomials have coefficients in K. Right, and uh, maybe let's uh, immediately give uh, the following reminder. So every k semi-algebraic subset of R to the n can in fact uh, even be written in that way. So it's a finite union uh, of sets uh, of this form defined by one polynomial equation and uh, finitely many poly uh, strict polynomial inequalities where all the polynomials have uh, coefficients from k, of course. Okay, and um, now we go to the first proposition. Um, so now we are in the section uh, of today, and uh, we go to the following proposition. So let A be uh, in K in this subfield and, uh, you know, let's look at the function H, which is defined for all uh, elements in the real closed field, which are strictly bigger than A. And, um, and, and suppose this is a K semi-algebraic function. Uh, when there is a b uh, greater than or equal a, uh, and actually uh, can be chosen in k even, such that uh, the absolute value of h of x is less than or equal x to the n for some positive integer n, for all uh, uh, positive, uh, for all uh, x bigger than b uh, in R, right? Okay, so maybe maybe let's quickly draw a picture. So you can imagine that this is R, and when we have this subfield uh, K, uh, you know, for example, R could be non-Archimedean and K could be a rational number. So in this, in this way, this is a bit hard to, to draw, but you know, K, uh, I mean, many elements uh, in R will be bigger than every element from K. That could happen, it doesn't have to be the case, but it could happen, right? And uh, so here I have somewhere my uh, my uh, a in k, and um, when I have this interval, I have this interval a infinity, and I have here I have this semi-algebraic function, you know. Uh, I need not be continuous or something. Okay. And so on. And uh, so this is, uh, you know, so here I have a second axis. And this is the graph of, of H. Graph of H. And um, yeah, and when when there is a uh, when there is a, uh, a B uh, when there is this B uh, greater than or equal A and actually in K. Somewhere, right? 
let's say here. Oh no, it should be in K, sorry. <laughs> okay, so let's say here. Ah, this dotted line should mean that uh, not all elements here are in K, even not in that region, of course. Right, and uh, when um, and when the absolute value uh, of of this function, right, uh, is uh, less than or equal some uh, yeah some x x to n for some fixed n, right, uh, on on the interval. Um, uh on the interval on this interval right so okay so that means uh yeah you have uh, it doesn't grow eventually doesn't grow bigger than a polynomial right <laughs> and uh and uh, and we and this uh, and this actually uh, this control growth already starts in some point uh, of k, more or less. Okay, so this is quite uh, this is uh, uh, the proof is a bit uh, a bit technical, but actually very easy. So uh, by um, so so since definition of a k-semi-algebraic function is that its graph is k-semi-algebraic. So the graph of H, you know, it's a subset of R2 over 2 and uh, it's semi-algebraic, so I can write it as a finite union of such sets, right? And so um, where the polynomials uh, Fi uh, and Gij are uh, polynomials over k in two variables. And you can suppose that each of these cases contributing to this union, yeah, you know that that was by by this remark we have already spoken spoken about, right? By this by this uh, reminder here. Okay, so, um, okay, and uh, so yeah, we can suppose that each of these cases contributing to the union is non-empty because otherwise we just. Uh, we just uh, don't consider that set, <laughs> right? We don't, uh, we don't, uh, we ignore it, and and so we must have that k is a positive integer, you know, because the graph of H is of course non-empty, because the domain of H is non-empty, and um, and uh, I claim that the degree of F i uh, uh, in in y, so if if I consider consider F i as a polynomial. Um, so if I consider f i as a polynomial over the polynomial ring in x in y, so I consider it as a univariate polynomial in y, but when the coefficients are again polynomials in x, right? And uh, seen in this way, the degree of f i is positive. That, that just means that f i is not a polynomial just in x. That means f i is not a polynomial just in x. Uh, I claim that this is, uh, and this is true for all i. I claim that this is automatically now, because you know, if 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 it were a polynomial just in X, then we would have for the corresponding i. I mean, at least for 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 one for one of these i's, we would have here uh, such such an equation depending just on X, right? Now I know that this equation, uh, because every each of these cases uh, contributes actually something. I know that there is a little x satisfying this equation, right? And such that there is a y, uh, so that x together with y satisfies these inequalities. Um, but then you know uh, there are actually several such y's or. Uh, infinitely many. So that's easy to show that's a continuity argument. Uh, you know, the, the function, because the function y maps to gij of xy is of course continuous function from r to r with respect to the order topology on r. And so it's an easy topological argument. 
Uh, and, uh, you know, that there are several such whys, more than one such why uh, contradicts, contradicts the fact that H uh, is a function. Okay. You, you know, that, that, that would mean that, uh, that would mean that uh, we had here uh, the graph would otherwise would uh, graph would have uh, such a piece in it, right? Uh, that's of course uh, impossible such a piece. <laughs> okay. Good. So um, okay, so now um, Yes, I what what I want now is that uh, I want actually to control uh, this y a little bit. So and 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 for this I will use uh, these equations, right? And I want actually one equation that that is satisfied uh, for all x, y in the graph of h, and and that's easy because I just take the product, you know. For, for all x, y in the graph of h, uh, there exists an i such that f i of x, y is zero, of course, because it's because this point is contained in this union. But then if I take the product of the f i's, when, when that's one equation, that, that gives one equation that is always satisfied. Okay? And uh, since k is a positive integer and the degree of each f i and y is bigger than zero, if I write, uh, if I expand this product, I get a, again, uh, I get here a polynomial in Y uh, of a positive degree, let's say D, uh, whose coefficients are polynomials uh, in, in X. So uh, PD is not a zero polynomial. And D is positive. Yeah, and now a bit technical, so I, I can we will see later why I want this, but of course I can rescale uh, with these fi's by by elements from from k, and so uh, I I see easily that uh, in fact uh, if I um, need to uh, rescale at most one of the fi's, but but what I can do so that so that I can suppose. Uh, that the leading coefficient of PD uh, is uh, is greater greater than one, right? I mean, PD must have is a univariate polynomial. It has a uh, is not a zero polynomial. It has a leading coefficient. Uh, might be negative. It might be positive. It might be smaller than one. But you know, it's easy to see. I can scale it by by some. I can multiply it with a non-zero element from the field K. Uh, of course, such that it gets uh, bigger than one. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and and so I can rescale with the same uh, element from K, I can scale one of the FIs and, and then that's, that does the job. And, and, and we will see later why, why I want to do this. And, and now I use... Uh, uh, now, now I apply uh, uh, on on this PD the leading co so on, on yeah on, on, on this univariate polynomial PD whose leading coefficient is greater than one. Uh, I I know of course that that this uh, I know the behavior at uh, at plus infinity right by one five three. Actually, I look instead of PD, I look at uh, PD minus one. Pd minus one. So, and and maybe there are even two cases. I guess that if a leading coefficient is a constant coefficient, so maybe by uh, by some coincidence, Pd is actually a, a constant from k, right? When 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 the leading coefficient is a constant coefficient, and when uh, uh, Pd minus one is is uh, is is a const a constant from k, which is uh, uh, positive, right? And and when uh, I I find such an interval c infinity where p d is bigger than one, trivially I can actually choose for g anything in 
in k intersected a infinity, for example, I could uh, choose uh, c equal a, right? So, but but the other cases where uh, PD is not a, a constant polynomial, when uh, PD minus one still has the same leading coefficient as PD had, so it has a positive leading coefficient, and when by one five three a, uh, of course uh, I know that it's uh, uh, positive uh, on uh, on 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 such on such an interval. So so and actually the c can be really chosen from k. That's um, important here. So one five three a. Let's let's look at it. Maybe uh, maybe let's, let's actually copy it because we need it uh, twice. We need it. Um, uh, so let's copy it. So. Okay. Okay. You know, uh, you see here. Uh, I mean, I'm I'm dealing here with uh, uh, positive. Uh, what is here interesting is that uh, the case where x is, is positive, right? You, so there is an x, a positive x in k. When I, when I can forget about this absolute value here, right? And then uh, you see for c, I could choose this thing, right? And um, yes. Okay, so because of uh, uh, now I have this one equation that is uh, satisfied for each element in the graph of H, uh, and uh, you know which comes from from this uh, from this product here. Maybe I should. Uh, okay, so that was this thing here. So I know that this is always zero, right? When I plug in an x and uh, for y, I, I plug in actually h of x, right? And uh, and uh, so 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 I look now uh, at uh, at another uh, uh, polynomial, namely I look at this uh, polynomial. Uh, uh, so, so, so for x in uh, uh, let's see for x in c infinity now uh, this interval in R uh, I uh, can look uh, at the polynomial at, at another univariate polynomial namely uh, sum of i equals 0 to d pi of x t to v i, you know, uh, for, for, for fixed x, I can look at this polynomial, right, uh, univariate polynomial, uh, and pd of x is non-zero for all x here, right, because actually pd of x is even bigger than 1, and so, uh, uh, so at the moment I use just that it's different from 0, uh, and so uh, I look at this polynomial and apply again on, on this polynomial, I apply again this thing here. And I see that, uh, by the way, here, if, if x is positive, I can forget about this thing here, right? Uh, and I see that, uh, um, that uh, h of the absolute value of h of x is uh, um, yeah be, because I have here a zero right uh, you know uh, sign of uh, of this polynomial is uh, you know f is now a polynomial sum equal zero i to d pi of x. Uh, t to i, right? Univariate polynomial. 
and um, and um, when x is bigger than this, when the sine of f of x is, is positive, because the leading coefficient was with pd of x, and that was actually bigger than zero, right? Uh, yes, pd of x bigger than zero. Yes, I mean, uh, I, I could also be, it, it doesn't matter, but uh, even if it were smaller than zero, the argument would be valid, but uh, it's, yeah. Okay, so when we, uh, we uh, in fact, uh, uh, if, uh, if uh, h of x, if the absolute value of h of x is uh, less than or equal this, then, then that cannot be a uh, zero, right? And, um, you know, we, we coefficient c, uh, absolute value of ci, that's, that's now this thing here, that's, we, that's these things. And, and, and now, um, um, Yes, because of this equation we have at this, yeah, use one, five, three. And then this is less, uh, okay, and P, absolute value of PD of X uh, was actually, uh, um, was actually, yeah, because X is in this interval, it's actually bigger than one, right? Uh, and so uh, I, c I can't just forget about it here, right? I, uh, since it's bigger than one, uh, this is true uh, without a denominator here uh, even more <laughs> maybe. And then, uh, and then instead of taking a maximum here, because these are just no negative numbers, I can take a plus, right? So, so what I see now is that, um, so I'm almost done. It's not quite what I wanted because what I have now here on the, on the right hand side uh, is, what I have now here is, let me maybe draw, what I have here now highlighted in orange is not quite what I wanted. I wanted actually, uh, if this were, if this w was what I wanted when, if this uh, uh, were what I wanted when I could uh, uh, take here uh, for this B here, it actually was C, right? Was C. So because the C is actually in K, right? But but uh, since this is maybe not what I wanted, maybe I have to change the C still. So why is it not what I wanted? I wanted here, uh, let me draw this here in blue. I wanted here X to the N, right? And what do I have? I have something like this. So with inequality here, right? So these two together, this says that, um, Okay, this is something like, let me just make an example, less than or equal uh, one plus absolute value of two x to the three plus uh, five x to the seven plus uh, uh, a three or a, <laughs> a one times uh, plus uh, a2 times x to the 3 plus a3 x to the 4 and so on, right? Plus, plus, plus. And maybe some pd minus 1 of x, I don't know, could, for example, be 3x to the 7 plus 7x to the 18, right? And the, and the AI is here, uh, the AIs are uh, elements of K, A1, A2, A3. 
Okay, and uh, but this is you know this is uh, certainly uh, less than so by using the triangle inequality, I can even say that I take here everywhere the absolute value, right? Okay, and then uh, by taking the maximum of these uh, uh, of the absolute values of two, okay, so maybe I can even take here even more, you know, uh, using the absolute value. I can pull out this constants and now I look at one absolute value of 2, absolute value of 5, absolute value of a1, absolute value of a2, and so on. And, and I replace it by some uh, by some capital C from k, such that this is less than or equal, uh, maybe, yeah, c, which is, uh, which is take a maximum of these things, yeah, so capital C would be greater than or equal 1, when so, and when I have here something like uh, 1 plus x to a 3 plus x to a 7 plus 1 plus x to a 3 plus x to a 4 plus 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 x to a 7 plus x to a 18, right? And now, you know, uh, uh, if, if x were greater than or equal 1, uh, when I could just say uh, x to a 7 is, for example, less than or equal x to a 18, right? And 1 is greater than or equal x to a 18, and, and all these things, right? And so, uh, so by taking, so actually, this, because I'm looking at x greater than c, if c is smaller than 1, then I could just say, now I take c, equal to be one of course right uh, you know the only thing that is important is that c is greater than or equal a so if c was smaller than one then when that will still be uh, fulfilled if i if i put c equal to one and c will also be in k so by changing c a little bit i look here only at x bigger than one and then, you know, I get here, of course, something like less than or equal, I don't know, I mean, because I don't know what's written here in the dots, but uh, maybe 237, uh, if I have 237 uh, terms in the sum, and it's less than or equal 237 times c, uh, times x to 18, for example, right? And now, uh, um, now I have this problem with this uh, x uh, with with this constant here, but now I can say okay, let's actually let's actually look uh, let's be more uh, radical and say that uh, c should actually be uh, at least two hundred thirty seven times capital C, which is okay, right? Because it's again uh, it's greater it's it's again an element from k. And uh, so, uh, and so, uh, when I could say, uh, uh, so x should be, when x is at least with 237 times c, I only look at these x, so I get here, I could make this trick here, and then I have here x to a 19. I hope I showed it in this example. It, actually, the easiest thing is, if you think about it yourself, maybe I'm also, maybe my argument is a bit too complicated. <laughs> So, but but now we exist, and then if you change when the c uh, accordingly, uh, when when you see that uh, when when we call it b, and and when and when when it's okay, right? Now the existence of b and maybe of capital n is easy to see. Okay. Now we come already to the uh, Vojasevich inequality. So Stanislav Vojasevich was a Polish mathematician who lived from 1926 until 2002 and is famous for contributions in many fields of mathematics, including real algebraic geometry. Okay, so what did he prove? Um, 
you prove to it, um, if you have two k semi algebraic functions uh, defined on a subset of R2Vn uh, and being continuous, uh, that when um, um, they are under certain circumstances, uh, which obviously you have to uh, suppose, uh, that they are comparable in this sense here. So, so you can actually find um, an exponent uh, big N and a positive integer and a, a non-negative constant from K such that um, the in absolute value you can compare uh, G and F in the following way. So the absolute value of G uh, on A to, to, to the power of capital N is less than or equal with constant uh, C times the absolute value of F. Okay, so um, in in order for something like this to hold, you need, of course, you know, when when where where f vanishes, you know, uh, of course, g has also to vanish when, right? So so we need to suppose this. So for all x in a, uh, where f vanishes, uh, g also vanishes, right? And um, yeah, and, and you know, that's, that's great, and uh, uh, that certainly uh, <coughs> wouldn't hold uh, in general if you drop uh, a k semi-algebraicity here. Of course, let's make an example. So if I take uh, r equal k equal to the reals, and I take uh, n uh, equal 1, and I take a to be the interval from 0 to 1 in the reals, right? That's closed and bounded with respect to the order topology on, on the real numbers, so that's certainly semi-algebraically compact. Um, and, um, and let's... Um, I mean, the order topology on the real numbers is the usual topology on the real numbers, right? And when I take... Uh, uh, for G, something quite harmless. So for G, let me take X goes to X. That's certainly continuous and semi-algebraic. And for F, I take uh, something a bit less boring. So uh, I take uh, X maps to zero if uh, x is zero and um, exponential of minus one over x if x is positive. So maybe let's draw a picture from zero to one. So I have a g is this boring function and f is uh, a more interesting function so f is zero where uh, at zero also and um, when you when you approach uh, zero from uh, from right right when one over x uh, goes to plus infinity and minus 1 over x goes to minus infinity and therefore this exponential goes to zero and therefore uh, it's actually continuous at this point and but it goes very quickly to zero right so minus 1 over x uh, goes uh, moderately in uh, with moderate speed to uh, minus 1 over x goes to minus infinity maybe with moderate speed but the exponential of it goes uh, to zero really really quickly and um, yeah, and let's maybe let's see. So at 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 one, if I put x equal one, when I get here, exponential of minus one, that's uh, 
minus uh, that's one over Euler's number so I don't know that's uh, probably somewhere here it doesn't matter too much and but here it's it really really uh, goes to zero very very quickly and yeah I know I don't know maybe something like this right uh, it's hard to draw. So uh, you see, uh, we have uh, this is fulfilled whenever f is zero. Uh, g is also zero, right? But the conclusion uh, here is not fulfilled. We will show in a moment, and that means okay, one of these two functions cannot be semi-algebraic. I mean, that one is for sure semi-algebraic. So that is actually not semi-algebraic, which is not surprising, right? But uh, yeah, that would be one way, for example, of proving that f is not semi-algebraic. Okay, because uh, because it contradicts Weyerseevich inequality. So why does it contradict if Weyerseevich inequality uh, hold it in this situation when I would have this? So I would have in particular that for all x in 0, 1, I don't include 0 here because I, yeah, at 0 it I would need a case distinction uh, anyway here because this is uh, defined by cases and at zero it's not interesting. So so I write just what is uh, outside from, um, from a point zero and where, so G is, uh, what does it mean I have this with capital N, there would exist with capital N, so at x to the N is less than an auricular constant times exponential of minus 1 over x right and now you you can play around you i mean you can uh substitute for uh let me write it in a different way so for all x in uh, one infinity so i replace uh, x by 1 over x right when i have here 1 over x to the n is less than or equal c times exponential minus x and maybe I even replace yeah that's okay maybe I even replace um, uh, yeah okay so uh, I could uh, Okay, so you, I think you, you know from uh, from your calculus course, or do you do it as an exercise? Uh, so that would be true. One would be less than or equal c times exponential of minus x times x to the n, right? And uh, you easily you easily find out that this cannot be true. Okay, because. Uh, when you let go x to infinity, uh, you know from calculus that uh, the limit um, of this is, is zero. And if you don't know it, then prove it again in some way. Okay, good. So this is um, so um, so for if both functions are semi-algebraic, such a thing cannot happen, right? So this somehow means probably that. Um, um, cannot go, some semi-algebraic function cannot go too quick to zero somewhere, right? <laughs> uh, <coughs> a continuous semi-algebraic function cannot do this. So now let's prove this. Um, okay. So, so what do we have? We had this proposition that uh, here that with semi-algebraic functions from, uh, yeah, essentially from, from a subset of reals to reals, uh, sorry, from a subset of R to R cannot grow, grow too, too quickly uh, at infinity, like not, 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 mo not more quickly than a polynomial. So, Somehow, this was just for functions from a subset of R, defined on a subset of R, that is R to the 1. Uh, that's the uh, first uh, thing which is different now here. 
And the other thing is that with said uh, you cannot go too too quickly to infinity, whereas um, whereas here we somehow say you cannot go too quickly to uh, to zero. Okay. <clears throat> so um, so yeah, we need we need somehow to to um, reduce this to a um, to a statement. Uh, of functions which are just defined on, on R. And um, the trick is that I look at level sets of, uh, of the absolute value of, of G. I look at level sets. Um, so, um, so, so think of uh, A, you know, is maybe this set here. Uh, sorry, you know, that's A, so, and uh, F vanishes, uh, um, so maybe F vanishes somewhere, so let's say F vanishes here, and maybe it vanishes here. So it's uh, on a right. So it's f equals zero. I mean, let me just write it like this. This is where f equals zero. Okay, and um, and when g uh, has also to be zero there, right? Because of this condition. So g uh, is also zero here. And maybe it's zero uh, also also here. Maybe it's zero also here. So okay. And then um yeah, so now I look at level sets of the absolute value of G. So I look um, at is I look at uh, where uh, g is uh, one over t. Uh, why one over t? Because uh, um, you know uh, it's interesting uh, where uh, g has small values. It gets interesting where g has small values. Whereas in the previous proposition, uh, the interesting part was where <coughs> where the functions get. Big values, okay. So I look, uh, I look. Uh, so that's why I take one over t. So a t is uh, is the level set of the absolute value of g uh, uh, corresponding to the value one over t. Okay. So um, so when t is big, you you can think of t as the time, and when 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 time proceeds, if t gets big, when when you approach uh, the when you approach uh, <coughs> the zero set of G. Um, and and these level sets uh, are uh, are all uh, K uh, semi algebraically compact. Okay? So since G is continuous, maybe uh, G one million. So when time is already very late, looks like could perhaps look like something like this, right? So that could be, and and but maybe there is also other things in it, right? That could happen. So G uh, A one million. Sorry, I wanted to say A one million. Could be that. Okay. And um. And now um, um, each of these uh, ATs 
is actually k semi algebraically compact. Why? Well, it's bounded because A is bounded, right? And uh, and it's uh, it's um, it's um, closed. Why? Because uh, x maps to g of x is continuous, and therefore also the absolute value of it. Uh, uh, x maps to the absolute value of g of x is also continuous. Uh, with respect to the product topology of the order topology. So, uh, so this is the pre-image of a singleton set under a continuous function. The singleton sets are closed, uh, you know, uh, easy to show. And um, yes, and so it's closed and uh, pre-image of a closed set under a continuous function is closed. And um, okay, so maybe there are some uh, some times where this a t is actually sometimes t where this a t is actually empty, and these are just uh, not very interesting for us. So let's call this uh, a, t, a set of all positive t where a t is uh, is uh, non-empty. That's the interesting set. So you could you could. Imagine e i for interesting, okay? So for each t in i, uh, we have, uh, um, for each t in i, uh, I look at, uh, yeah, so, so maybe I should first explain the idea. Um, so, Whenever, um, whenever um, g is, uh, wherever g is zero, where, where is nothing to prove here, right? Whenever g is zero, that will be automatically true. Uh, so uh, it's, uh, I need actually to look here only uh, for the union of the ATs, right? And actually the union over I. So I could, because that's the only set where, uh, because all the rest is so, yeah, maybe maybe I do it slowly. So first I could say, I take here the union over all positive T of AT, right? And, but then of course, uh, those ATs which are empty, uh, that's, uh, uh, that is not uh, <laughs> relevant, so I can just take here t in i, right? Okay, so I could say here that for all t in i, I have to prove for all t in i, and then um, for all x in, in a t, I have to prove this, right? But no, on, on a t, the g of x is 1 over t. So I can actually replace here by this by 1 over t. Okay. And, um, and now uh, I could actually say, okay, but then let's, uh, let's, lo let's look at, uh, uh, instead of saying, I mean, g of x was constant. The absolute value of g of x was constant on a t, but f not. So the trick is now that I define ft to be the minimum of the absolute value of f of x, uh, where x range, ranges over at. That does this minimum ac actually, and, and when I and when I I can replace here this here by by ft. But that, let let me already write this. So when I write here, ft. But does this minimum actually ex exist? Yeah, this exists because a t is k semi algebraically compact. Uh, f and therefore also the absolute value of f is a, is a k semi algebraic function, and it's uh, also continuous. So images of k semi algebraically compact uh, sets under uh, k semi algebraic continuous k semi algebraic functions are k semi algebraically compact now uh, that so the set that I highlighted just in yellow is therefore 
uh, k-semi-algebraically compact compact subset of R. Uh, sorry, of R. Now, um, now I use six one nineteen B. Yeah, six one eighteen was as I said already. This thing about the images and six one nineteen B was um, characterization of uh, was this here the semi algebraically complex subsets of R are exactly the finite units of pairwise disjoint sets of this form, right? And a set of this form has, of course, a minimum, namely A. And if you take a finite union of such sets, well, uh, then you also uh, see immediately that this has a minimum, right? Okay, so this minimum does exist. The smallest element does exist. Um, yeah, note that uh, T was chosen in an interesting set I, so A T was not empty, in particular this was not the empty set, right? So that's why this minimum then exists. And then, uh, so what, what we have to show is uh, that there exists uh, uh, N, N in N and uh, uh, non-negative C in K, such that, uh, and now comes what I have already written here, for all T in I, um, um, and now, now one, once, I, once I wrote this, I can actually replace, uh, I mean, nothing depends on, on x anymore, right? Neither the left-hand side nor the right-hand side of this inequality depends on x, so I can actually move away with quantifier here. Okay, and that's what I did here. When I have just 1 over t to the n, uh, it's less than equ equals c times ft. Right, um, and I know that uh, you know whenever, wherever g is uh, non-zero, f is also non-zero. That's the contraposition of this, right? Wherever g is non-zero, f is also non-zero. So and on a t g uh, was non-zero because it was constantly. I mean, the absolute value of it was constantly one over t. So I know that on a t um, this absolute value of f of x is never zero because this is a minimum. Uh, the minimum is also of this form, and so it has to be positive. Uh, so we know that f t is positive for all t in i. Furthermore, um, we look now at the following function, namely uh, from the positive uh, elements of R into R. T maps to zero if T is not in the interesting set. And, uh, and uh, one over FT if T is in the interesting set. And uh, well, I don't think it's important whether I took here zero. I, I think I wanted just to choose something. <laughs> okay, so that it's defined on on the positive axis. Um, yeah, it's uh, this must not be continuous. In the previous proposition, we didn't assume for the semi-algebraic function that it is continuous, and this is clearly k. Uh, semi-algebraic, right? That's uh, an easy exercise. You know, uh, we know that we can use quantifiers um, over R uh, in in our definitions uh, of uh, semi-algebraic uh, K semi-algebraic sets, and and this is really an easy exercise. So this is of course K semi-algebraic. Thus. Um, uh, I know that um, by the previous proposition that 1 over ft is less than or equal t to the n uh, from some point of time on, right? Um, so there is some point of time b, positive in k, such that from that time on, 
uh, I I have uh, this uh, and uh, and and also I have uh, at, at these are for the interesting times and for the non-interesting times I would have zero less than or equal t to the n, but that's anyway <laughs> fulfilled, right? Okay, so um, yes, um, okay. Now um, let's look where we are. Uh, so um, oh, sorry, and by the way, I forgot here the exponent n here, right? I should have put it. You might have remarked, right? I forgot it. So. Um, you know, and if you bring this to the other side here, when you have here one is less than or equal ft times t to the n, right? And that's uh, he, that's already I could bring the ft here also to the other side. That's already what what we need. We the only thing is that here we have it only for um, for for time points of time which are very very late right okay so so we need to take care uh, also uh, for the whole rest so in our picture uh, points of time where we are very late correspond to being really close uh, yeah uh, I, I mean at least if I'm really close to the zero set of of uh, of f, which is a critical thing, when when I'm also really close to a zero set of g, and when uh, uh, and uh, and when uh, this this is the important the important thing. Um, so I have already somehow I've already clarified. Uh, the whole thing uh, um, when when I'm close to to a zero set of f, and uh, and that, that seemed to be the main problem. Uh, but I did not yet use this constant at the moment. I could take for the constant still one here, but uh, the constant comes from the fact that I have also take to take care of 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 uh, of the things where I'm. I have also to take care for for the region where uh, f is uh, not close to zero, right? So when I'm away from the zero set of f, I also have to take care of this. Well, and and when I'm away from the zero set of f, when when I did not have um, when when I don't know what g does, g could be very very big, right? And and um, and therefore, uh, I I need uh, <clears throat> this constant c. So let's look now uh, the set B, which is when, yeah, act actually where where g is zero. If I'm close to where g is zero, when I don't have a problem. So, um, right when I don't have a problem. So let's let's look at this set where g is stays away from zero, right. And actually, uh, I take this B here. So B is the set of all X in A where G stays away. So I don't know exactly what that corresponds to in the picture, but maybe it's something like, um, okay, so maybe it's, you know, this thing here and this. I don't know exactly, right? I don't want to think about it now so much. Okay, so... Um, I can write this as the union of all ATs uh, where uh, T is between zero and uh, B, right? So, yes, okay. And it's enough to take the, the interesting uh, Ts because for the others, the AT is anyway empty. Okay, and this is k semi-algebraically compact, 
you know, because uh, it's a subset of a, of a bounded set and, and it's certainly closed again because the absolute value of g of x is, um, of g, x maps to absolute value of g of x is, is continuous. Uh, and uh, so this is the pre-image of, of an interval under a continuous, uh, under, under a continuous function. Okay, and so uh, this is K-semi-algebraically compact and we can choose uh, some, uh, and I can again use, uh, um, I, ca I can uh, use that um, on this set, a continuous function uh, is bounded from above. So this is just, you know, because uh, the image and under a continuous function here is uh, is uh, under continuous k semi algebraic function is uh, again k semi algebraically compact when this is a subset of, of R and k semi algebraically compact subsets of R are unions of uh, intervals so 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 of of intervals of um, so so I use again this thing here finite unions of such intervals. So I, so in order to, uh, yeah, so that's clear. Okay, so, uh, and, and such a union of intervals is bounded from above by some C, actually uh, non-negative. Uh, I, I can say uh, an element greater than or equal one in K, right? Greater than, greater than or equal one is without loss of generality. I, I, I like this for some reason. Uh, and now, um, yeah, and you know, x maps to, to this function is, of course, uh, is, of course, a uh, continuous k-semi-algebraic function because uh, that makes sense because uh, f of x does not vanish uh, on this set, right? Because where f vanishes, because where f vanishes, g has to vanish. So... I don't divide by zero here. Okay. That's true for all x and b. And we deduce uh, star star. So we so we deduce that uh, now for uh, you know for uh, if I look at that on 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 a t right. Uh, So if I take an interesting point of time t, an early point of time, uh, then uh, I am, uh, if I take such an early point of time, so, and, and I look uh, at a t, then where uh, g of x, absolute value of g of x is 1 over t. So I can put it to the other side, that, that gives t uh, 1 over t to the n, and then I can move it to the other side, and here we, this absolute value here is on a t, you know, f t was the minimum, of these absolute values, uh, and uh, yeah, so yeah, by choosing a point uh, in AT where this minimum is assumed, uh, I get this, and that's almost the same thing as here. Here I had it uh, for times bigger than b, and here I have it for times smaller or less than or equal b, just interesting times every time, right? And here I have a constant, here I didn't yet have a constant, but the constant is greater than or equal one, uh, that's uh, how I chose it. So I could also add a constant here if I like, right? So I get exactly the same thing. So I get for all positive uh, times, uh, interesting times, I get, uh, uh, I get, uh, I get, uh, 
Double Star, uh, for all interesting times, and uh, interesting times are anyway positive, and and that's what what uh, what I had uh, uh, to show if you remember right. If you, if you look uh, once more on this at this thing, okay. So that's why I say which inequality. So now we um, next want a version of a Voyasevich inequality, which does no longer suppose that A is uh, K-semi-algebraically compact and works instead uh, just if A is just closed, right? But not necessarily bounded. And, uh, but then you can imagine that, uh, of course, uh, I cannot uh, keep the same um, statement here. Uh, no, so that was the original statement. I cannot keep this statement here uh, because, well, because G might actually grow uh, quickly when you go out to infinity and uh, F need not to do so. Okay, so, um, but on the other hand, we had this result that um, at, least, at least in this situation, uh, so this result was about um, K-semi-algebraic functions cannot grow too quickly, in, at least in this situation, right? And so now we want to combine both. And um, yeah, and so there, there, there are certainly, so, so and, and that we will be able to do by replacing, uh, by inserting here another factor, um, so here, which uh, which uh, which models a polynomial growth uh, at infinity, just polynomial, not more, right? So that will be then with corollary, and here you see uh, this factor, which we will insert. So we now saying that not just there exists an n, but there exists n and k, right? And c. Right, so, um, yeah, so, and and probably we could have somehow done the proof again, the proof of Weyasevich inequality taking care of this different situation, but uh, we prefer to reduce it to Weyasevich inequality because uh, it's, it's, it's nice to see that um, uh, semi algebraic compactness uh, can so is is not always an obstacle. So so if you have a hype of a hypothesis on K semi algebraic compactness, that's not always an obstacle of employing the theorem uh, of of employing uh, the theorem in non compact situations, right? And uh, not always, right? So. And for one, one, uh, one way of uh, trying to get into a compact situation is the, the shrinking map. Uh, and I mean, there are also certainly different versions of this, but uh, I will present one of them. So uh, I'm looking at R to the N. So let's say here is the, here is the origin of R to the N. And when I look at, um, I look at uh, the sphere. Okay, so I have here a sphere. So this is, you know, that's a two norm, right? That's the square root of the sum of the xi squared. It's not really a norm in a classical sound sense because it's valued in a in a real closed field in general. So it's S, and then uh, and then I have this uh, kind of open ball, right? It's actually open in the product topology. So I can really say an open ball. Oh, 
wait. Okay. Ah. I really have problems with these colors. Okay. So, you know, that's what is inside here. Okay, so that's B. Okay, and um, what I what I want to do now is uh, prob if I have an unbounded set, I want to make it into a bounded one, right? And then uh, the problem is that I might lose closeness, and for this uh, we deal with this issue by uh, adding this sphere. So let's see what we are doing. So first of all. Uh, so I, I want to get anything into this ball to to establish boundedness. So if I have a point, uh, if I have a point x somewhere here, then you know if I if I took x divided by the norm of x, when I when I'm of course on the that would be projecting on on the on this sphere, right? So uh, so that's not what what I what I want to do. Because when I, I would lose one dimension and this would not work for what I want to do. So instead I'm saying I, I want actually to get into, into B. So I will actually divide uh, by a little more, a little more than this, right? So and actually I um, I take um, I take instead of a norm of x, I take uh, 1 plus the norm of x squared, right? And, and then the square root of it. Right? If, if, I, if, I, if I don't have the 1 plus here, then it's exactly, when I would exactly land on, on the sphere. But since I have a 1 plus norm of x squared, square root, I'm at, I'm have here a little more in the denominator and 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 I land here somewhere in B, and the idea is also that you know the origin stays at the origin here, and if I'm close to the origin, for example, uh, when uh, this norm here is small, and then I divide essentially just by a little more than than one, right? So if I'm close to the origin, I almost stay where I am. Uh, and but if I'm far away from the origin, I move really into B. Yes, and so it's, I think it's quite uh, quite easy to to understand this map. Now um, now I want also be an inverse map from B to R to V N. Now you you can calculate it so. But and we will do this in a proof actually. But just think about uh, yeah, what does it do? So uh, the origin goes again to the origin, and if if I if I'm in B, if y is in B, when this is actually this square root is well defined, this is actually when a positive number, and square root is a positive number, and so if if y is uh, if y is close to zero, I'm dividing by a little less than one, right? And uh, if uh, y gets close to close to the sphere s, uh, then uh, this gets close to zero, and then divide by I divide by a big number, right? So it, you could imagine that this is perhaps the, the inverse map, and actually we can calculate this. So both these maps are q semi algebraic. Do I need to show this? I think you did more difficult things yourself, right? So, but let's let's look at, uh, for example, the graph of uh, phi is the set of all x, y, in uh, R n. Uh, sorry, in uh, R n cross R. Uh, maybe I shouldn't use y because y later is. Uh, stands here for something different. So let me call it a set. Okay. Uh, 
So X set in our ring cross R such that uh, you know set equals x over the square root of 1 plus norm x squared and but I can move the square root to the other side and then I can uh, okay so so I can write set times the square root x and then I can uh, write here this coordinate wise so set one equals x one up to set n equals xn and then I can uh, you know I can actually square it but when I have to take care of it we set I have the same uh, sign when we xi okay so I could save it set 1 squared times 1 plus x1 squared plus 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 xn squared equals x1 squared uh, and set uh, one is smaller than zero and x1 is smaller than zero or set one is zero and x1 is zero or Maybe I, I don't, uh, yes, uh, or uh, certainly there are better ways of doing it, but I don't care about that. Uh, or this, and, and then for a second coordinate and so on, right? So I think you know how to do it. And this is when a Boolean combination of, you know, sets defined by equations and inequalities. And so even without quantify elimination, I can do this easily. Okay, so this is uh, Q semi algebraic continuous, you know, it's also easy to show and inverse to each other. But we will show in the proof for all K semi algebraic subsets of R to Vn. We have that A is closed, now it gets interesting, A is closed if and only if its image under phi, uh, yeah, uh, union S is K semi algebraically compact, right? Of course, uh, we cannot just take uh, we cannot just take here. Uh, I mean, this union S plays an important role, right? If we didn't have this, then it would of course not be true, right? For example, take R equal R to the N, and then you could actually show that phi of A is exactly B, but B is certainly not closed, right? Okay. Okay, so, but if I take union S, when, when it actually works, right? So we, uh, intuition is like this. So if A, uh, let me use this color. So if A, uh, is for example such a set uh, what is enclosed by a I don't know maybe parabola <laughs> okay then uh, it should be closed right so then its image uh, you know might be something like uh, might be, I don't know exactly, might be something like uh, like this here. Where of course this is not in the set, right? Because everything is actually in B. 
And then this would certainly not be closed, but if I take now a union uh, with S, you know, when, when, when I get, uh, when my new set looks a bit like this, Yeah, and, that, and that's a strange looking set, but it's closed. <laughs> okay, good. Um, and and actually this is if and if and only if. And that's a nice thing. So this this uh, allows us to uh, somehow associ associate with a closed set uh, a compact set, right? So. And, and then, of course, uh, that we have to add with sphere could be a problem uh, depending on, on what we want to do, right? But, uh, yeah. but if we can deal with this problem, then uh, we can prove something for closed sets if we can prove it for compact, for KCM algebraically compact sets. Okay. So now let's prove these things. So Q semi-algebraicity and continuity are clear. It's an easy exercise for all X in R to be N. We have Psi of Phi of X is, uh, yes, so Phi of X. So I plug in the, I plug in this for Y, right? When I get this complicated, complicated looking thing. And then uh, you see that this, uh, you know, this, uh, simplifies easily to uh, yeah to one over this square root and this is this and when I get x okay so and the other way around for all y and b uh, here I replace uh, the x here by by this expression so. I get this, so when I have this, 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 uh, one minus y squared, yes, exactly, I get this, so I get y, <laughs> okay, um, okay, yeah, and uh, so they are inverse to each other. Uh, the only thing that remains to show is that A is closed is with if and only if, right? A is closed if and only if this is closed. I mean, this is bounded anyway, right? This is bounded anyway. So, uh, because it's contained in this uh, ball, right? And and uh, so K semi-algebraically compact, because it's also K semi-algebraic, of course. This is certainly K semi-algebraic, right? Um I mean, uh, phi of a, since phi is k semi algebraic and a is k semi algebraic, uh, phi of a is also k semi algebraic, right? I mean, that's, I think that also uses quantify elimination, but that was, you know, images of k semi algebraic sets under k semi algebraic maps are k semi algebraic so this is anyway k semi algebraic so this union is also k semi algebraic because this is also k semi algebraic and then um, so k semi algebraicity is, is of course uh, for sure here and then boundedness is also for sure a uh, given and so the only thing is if this is closed we have only to show that a is closed if and only if phi, phi of a union s is closed right Okay, so I guess there is an easy direction uh, if phi of a union s is closed, then you know if I take the uh, um, topological subspace B of R to the N, you know, uh, take the induced topology. Um, so phi of e is when closed in b, okay. Phi of a is when closed in b. Why? Uh, because it's an intersection of a closed set 
of R, in R to the n with b. And, uh, you know, this equation here is clear, right? Phi of a is contained in b and in this union. And for the other direction, uh, if uh, I have a point in phi of a uh, union s, uh, which is at the same time in B when it is actually not in S and when it is in phi of A and okay. So that's that's trivial here. Um, so this is closed in B. And and then um if I take uh, a pre image under phi, uh pre images of closed sets are closed. Um yes when uh yeah when I when I get back A and so A is closed in R N. And yeah, so that was really easy. So the other direction let A be closed when uh phi of A is uh psi to a minus one of uh uh of A and this therefore uh, psi is also continuous, so it's therefore closed in in B, and hence it's an intersection of a closed set in R to the N with B. Uh, and um, um, well, without loss of generality, so by intersecting, uh, so B union S, you know, is, is closed. Easy to see, that's like a closed ball, right? And uh, uh, I, I could intersect here C with B union S, of course. That wouldn't change anything. Um, that wouldn't change this intersection, of course. But it would, uh, and it wouldn't change the closeness because an inter intersection of two closed sets is closed. So, so without loss of generality, I can actually assume that C is contained in B union S. Okay. And, uh, and, um, and actually I can, uh, Yeah, actually, I can um, assume that S is contained in C uh, because I could otherwise uh, replace S by C union S. You know, uh, union of uh, of two closed sets is is closed, um, and. Uh, and this doesn't change the fact that C is contained here, and it does also not change uh, this intersection here. So, uh, okay, so actually, uh, so now we have phi of A union S is contained in C because S is contained in C also, uh, is contained in C intersected B union C intersected S, right? Because, yeah, because C is contained in B union S and, uh, yes. And this is uh, phi of A uh, union uh, S, right? Because S is contained in C. So I have here actually everywhere in e equations, so equality. So phi of a union s, you know, because here is the same as here and I have a chain of inclusions. Actually, here is even an equality. And, and then these inclusions have to be, uh, have to be fulfilled with equality. And so phi of a union s equals uh, c. And uh, and C is uh, closed. Okay, it was just a bit technical, but not hard either. Okay. So now we come to our uh, Voyasevich inequality for uh, 
non-bounded, possibly non-bounded, closed case image algebraic sets. And we will use with shrinking map and its inverse. Okay, so Okay, so let n be a non-negative integer and suppose that a is a closed subset of R2bn and f and g are this time uh, are again, uh, are again uh, defined on a and are continuous k-semi algebraic functions but this time a need not be bounded, right? And okay, a is automatically of course uh, k-semi algebraic being the domain of a k-semi algebraic function but it need not be bounded anymore. And I have again this condition here, uh, exactly like in the Sivic inequality, and uh, now there are n and k, a new thing is with k, right? Such that, uh, such that this is true, and so a new thing here is, of course, this factor here. Okay. So by 6, 1, 4, so we want to reduce this to a Voyasevich inequality. A is k semi algebraic because it's the domain of a k semi algebraic function. And if A is bounded, then A is k semi algebraically compact. And the claim follows even with k equal 1 from a Voyasevich inequality 6, 2, 2. Well, even with k equal 0, if you want. So I could even replace this by 1. But, okay, for some reason I prefer to write here k okay, a positive integer, it doesn't matter, uh, when, uh, when, uh, when I can take k equal 1 or k equal 2 or whatever I like, right? Um, so as I said, could take k equal 0, but I said here be, be, probably because I was lazy uh, or I thought it was better, I said here k okay, should be a positive integer. Okay, when it follows from a Voyasevich inequality, now suppose that A is unbounded, right? When the set of all norms of elements of A is, of course, K semi algebraic. And since this is a union of uh, intervals, there must be some A in K such that such an interval here is contained in it. And uh, now I define two functions on this interval. And why do I do this? Uh, because, um, you know, I want to apply um, Voyasevich, the original Voyasevich inequality, uh, of course, uh, yeah, I, uh, on this set here, right? On the set, on the shrinked A, on the shrinked version of A, Union, uh, union, uh, the sphere, right? Uh, but the problem is that I should, um, that you know, f might grow quickly uh, and g also when I when I go uh, to infinity. So that so that means somehow that, uh, um, yeah, I I should have new versions of so I have a new ver I have a shrinked version of of a right, but but I need to to consider this set so that I get into a k semi algebraically compact framework, and uh, so in some sense I also have to shrink uh, the the graphs of f and g, but the problem is that f and g wouldn't. Uh, wouldn't be defined with shrinked versions of f and g wouldn't be defined on s a priori. Now, if I want to define them on s because I need a continuous function, uh, it's really a problem that uh, that f and g uh, that f and g um, might grow quickly when I go to infinity, right? But so uh, so somehow I would have tendency to define the new shrinked f and g on s 
uh, uh, by saying that we are infinity on S or something like this, <laughs> which is not possible, right? Because infinity is not an element of my real closed field. Okay, so um, so so uh, the solution is that we will, in some sense, damp the graphs of f and g uh, at infinity, in some sense, right? And this uh, how how we have to damp it. Uh, this uh, will be uh, now uh, this we try to figure out by the growth of two functions f uh, f circle and g circle. Um, F circle and G circle. I'm now I'm now going to define, but they they measure somehow how fast F and G grow, right? And um, they are defined on this interval. So uh, on this interval, it makes sense uh, to say that uh, to define them like this. T maps to the maximum of this. So I take a sphere. A sphere centered at the origin of of radius t, where t is from this interval, and and on on this sphere, um, um, yeah, where, where on these spheres of radius t, there is a point where 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 um, there is a point from a, so there is a point where f and g are defined. And then, since these spheres are k semi-algebraically compact and f is k semi-algebraic continuous, I know that this maximum here exists and this one too. Okay, and um, so these are two semi-algebraic functions, and and we know they cannot grow too quickly. So there is uh, by our proposition from the beginning of a section there is a b greater than or equal a and actually in k. And I can take it greater than or equal one because this will help for a technical reason. And where there is L and um, where is some L, I can take the same one. A priori, I have an L one and L two, but now I have I can then take the same one. Of course, I take, can take a bigger one. So that f circle of t and g circle of t are both less than or equal one plus t squared two L, right? The one I wouldn't need actually. Um, uh, uh, by this proposition, I get could get here a bound like t to be l, but then I can also get t to be two l, and uh, then I can also get one plus t squared to be l. Okay, that's just technically better for me. And now consider the continuous k semi-algebraic functions. Um, so these are now with stamped versions, right? They are defined on A. Uh, and uh, I take actually L plus 1 here, okay? That will be important. I take actually a bit more than L, okay? And that, that will guarantee that F0 and F and G0 tend to 0 when I, when I go to infinity in some sense, right? <laughs> When, when I'm far from the origin, they, they get very small values. That's because I took actually plus one here even. Okay. Uh, and then, uh, and also we have, of course, still this, the same property we had for f and g. We have also for f0 and g0, that's trivial. And obviously it is enough to show uh, that... Um, Yeah, it's enough to show exactly exactly this here for G0 and F0 instead of G and F. Uh, and, um, you know, because the only thing, uh, the only thing, uh, you know, with this denominator here, this one here actually, uh, is taken to the power of N here. And and if you move it to the other side, when when it gives you such a such a factor here, right? So 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 here you see why we why we will need this factor because we work with f zero and g zero, and okay, what what is written here? The denominator of f zero actually 
would actually help, right? But uh, uh, since we have here to a power of n, if n is big, then of course the denominator of g0, uh, actually we cannot prevent the denominator of g0 to introduce this, this factor here. Okay. Okay, so, and, and of course, so, and of course, uh, here we, we won't need this factor anymore. So for f0 and g0, here we could also afford such a, such a factor, right? But uh, we don't need it anymore. And now uh, we just have to apply where well, say which inequality, where is just one obstacle still. Well, the only obstacle is that the domain of uh, uh, that the domain of uh, of uh, of f zero and g zero is still not closed, right? So we still. Uh, uh, it's still not bounded, it's still not bounded, sorry. It's closed, but still not bounded in general. Okay. So, um, yeah, here I, here, I, here I say what, how we have to choose the k-even, right? So we have this, because I'm taking, yeah, this n, this n, n times, L plus one, n times L plus one is the thing that is introduced by the, by this denominator of G here, yeah, because it's taken to the power of N here. But, and the minus one comes because part of it is compensated by the denominator for F zero. That doesn't help, of course, because we don't know what capital N is. Um, and even if it, yeah, even if we knew it helps just a tiny little bit to keep the K smaller. And yeah, I take you a maximum with one just because I said K okay, should be greater than or equal to one in the end. So the advantage of F0 and G0 where F and G is that where um, it varies for, okay. Um, advantage of f0 and g0 over f and g uh, is that there is for all epsilon in a real closed field r bigger than zero a semi-algebraically compact set b such that the absolute value of f0 of x uh, is smaller than epsilon um, and the absolute value of g0 of x is smaller than epsilon. Uh, for all x in A uh, without B. Note what I said here, just uh, semi-algebraically compact. So that means uh, R semi-algebraically compact. I didn't say K semi-algebraically com semi compact. Okay. Um, so let's, uh, so, so for people who know the Alexandrov compactification of a topological space, that's actually uh, something very natural because, um, because this complement of uh, this semi-algebraically compact set <coughs> would be, um, the idea is that this is a neighborhood of, um, a neighborhood of, um, infinity in some sense, right? So, um, so that, that means uh, for all positive epsilon, there is a neighborhood of infinity where both f0 and fg and uh, absolute value of f0 and g0 um, are less than epsilon. So that means f0 and g0 um, go to zero uh, at in, in 10 to zero, uh, at infinity, right? So, and, and why is this true? Uh, why is this true? Uh, well, it's very easy. In, in fact, uh, for this uh, semi-algebraically compact set, we could simply take uh, a ball, we could simply take a, a close ball around zero, right? And why? So, uh, so, so, so let's say so. So we are given 
suppose we are given epsilon bigger than zero. Let epsilon be bigger than zero, element of a real closed field. And we want to find a T0, uh, well, let's say bigger than, bigger than zero, such that Um, such that for all x in A without B, but for B I take now the complement of a close ball around zero of radius T zero, right? So saying that x is not in B means that the norm of x is bigger than uh, T zero. And so in my, if I'm in A without B, then I want uh, to uh, that um, the absolute value of f0 of x is smaller than epsilon and also the one of g0. Right, and maybe let me write this in a slightly more complicated way. Instead, I write for all x, uh, uh -huh, for all, okay, maybe I, okay, let, let, let me do the following. So I actually can say I want it even to be bigger than b, you know, b is greater than or equal to one. So in, here I could say uh, T zero should should be even bigger than than B. Uh, do this for technical reasons, and then I can say here that uh, I can express this in in a more complicated way. I can say for uh, let me write this now in green for all uh, x in A. And for all t uh, greater than or equal t0, or actually uh, bigger than t0, bigger than t0, if a norm of x equals t, then uh, yeah, and when I, when I take what is written above, okay, so let me copy it. Then this, right? Okay. And, um, and now I use the, okay, so maybe first, so let me actually, uh, Let me actually forget about this thing here, right? So I actually want to show this statement, which is as, a, a, at least as strong. And now I use the definition of, uh, I use the definition of, um, um, of G zero and, um, and F zero, right? Uh, so I get here um, f of x, absolute value of f of x, divided by 1 plus norm of x squared to the L plus 1. And this norm of x here I can replace by the t here. Okay, so 1 plus t squared to the L plus 1. And here also absolute value of g of x divided by one plus t squared to the l plus one. And now um, um, I can actually use the definitions of f uh, yeah, a bit strange. Green doesn't work anymore. Just for color green does not work anymore. Okay, <laughs> it's really strange. Uh, okay, when I take here blue. Okay, so now I take the definitions of f circ and g circ. Um, yeah, because I have here the norm of x is t, right? 
I can replace this norm of f of x by the maximum on this sphere of radius t. Uh, so uh, I can replace it by f head of uh, by f circ of uh, uh, of t here, and so that's at least as strong then. Okay. So here I replace. So I take instead a head of t and here and, and that's not equivalent but that's at least as strong. So it suffices to show this show with stronger statement, right? Okay. Small epsilon, small epsilon. And then finally I take here uh, I take here, uh, you know, I know these two things. Okay, again, green does not work. So let me take orange maybe. So when I take these two things and uh, it suffices when to show uh, the same thing here. Uh, with uh, F circ of T. Ah, sorry, with um, 1 plus t squared 2L, and here also 1 plus t squared 2L, but when both of these conditions are the same, of course, so I don't need this conjunction anymore. So let me just delete this second condition here. Okay, oh sorry, uh, I'm sorry I have a little problem here, our software has a little problem. Okay. Okay. Okay, and you see that uh, here we have uh, 1 over, so the exponent L that cancels here, of course, right? This cancelled with this, and so we have here actually just 1 over t squared less than epsilon. Um, So 1 over uh, 1 plus t squared is less than epsilon, right? And now this is, uh, um, yeah, and, and I don't need this anymore because x does not even appear anymore, right? So that doesn't play any role anymore. So, yeah, and, and that's, that's, of course, uh, very easy to show. Okay, that's <laughs> your exercise I let you do. And uh, note that uh, note that um, um, t zero. Uh, so I, I I guess I cannot because epsilon was uh, was not chosen from k. I, I don't think I I could guarantee that t zero can be chosen in in k. Yeah, it gets definitely not. I guess right. So if if epsilon uh, if the elements of k are all bound of uh, finite, so that means they lie between two rational numbers, right? Uh, then um, and and if epsilon is infinitesimal, then I certainly need uh, certainly need an infinite t which is bigger than every rational number, right? So I I don't say I can and can take t zero in k good so but but this shows that that this is true right um, okay so now with a uh, notation of uh, um, of uh, of our um, you know 
know, of our shrinking. Of our of our shrinking lemma here. If I take the um, notation of a, of a shrinking lemma, so S is with unit sphere and B is with ball. Uh, open unit ball, and uh, when you know we know that A is close, F is is with shrinking map from our end to a open unit ball, and A is closed if and only if the image under the shrinking map union with sphere is K-semi-algebraically compact. Now, if we use this, um, the K-semi-algebraic um, functions. Uh, yeah, you know, phi is with shrinking map and psi is its inverse. When I take these uh, semi-algebraic functions, f tilde and g tilde, which are finitely, finite, which are finally defined on a k semi-algebraically compact set, right? Because a was closed, so phi of a union s is k semi-algebraically compact. That's implied by this shrinking lemma. And uh, now I define on S, I define, def I define it uh, as zero and for G tilde also. And otherwise I define it as, you know, I, I do the inverse shrinking. So we enlargening if you want. And, um, uh, and, then, uh, and then I take the value at Psi of Y of, uh, of F zero at Psi of Y. And and here the same thing, right? Um, yes. So so this is now this g tilde and uh, f tilde finitely are defined uh, um, finally are defined on a k semi algebraic uh, k semi algebraically compact subset, uh, and they are uh, continuous. We will show this in a moment, and they are of course <coughs> k semi algebraically K semi algebraic. <laughs> okay, uh, easy to show. So they are they are continuous. Uh, why are they continuous? Well, uh, for this we use of course um, this what what we said is the advantage over f and g, namely uh, where it is for all epsilon bigger than zero is. Okay. Um, let's see, uh, for example, let's see it for F tilde, for G tilde, it's exactly the same proof. So with F tilde, uh, is, uh, continuous means, so, so I use, I use, uh, my, I, I use six, one, seven, that was with, uh, epsilon delta characterization of continuity. And uh, together with 6111, which says that we can also uh, do the same thing with the two norm instead of the infinity norm. So 617 was, uh, sorry, 617 uh, was here, right? So, um, yeah, this was with epsilon delta characterization. Right and and here I did it with infinity norm, but you can also take the two norm, which is just uh, written like this, and that was um, that was said uh, here, right, in six one eleven. Okay, good. Um, Yeah, so we have uh, we have to show in order to show that f tilde is continuous, we would have to show therefore uh, um, the, the following thing here. Um, now normally, I would have to to go here. Uh, I would have to take here phi of phi of a union s, right? And then comes here the epsilon, the delta, the y. And normally, this would be phi of a union s. So that I have here the domain, and here also the domain of f tilde. And then uh, here, normally, I would have to write f tilde. Okay, here I would have to write um, absolute value of f tilde 
of uh, of uh, y minus f tilde of y zero. Okay, less than epsilon. Okay, good. Now, um, now this uh, universal quantifier here, I can of course split it splits this statement up uh, in one statement where I prove it for y zero in phi of a, y zero in phi of a, and another statement where I prove it for y zero in s, right? And let's first speak about uh, what is probably the easier case, namely if I take phi of a, right? And um, and when I claim that I don't need this union S here, right? Why don't I need this union S here? Because, uh, you know, phi of A is phi of A union S intersected B. That's easy to see, right? S and B are disjoint. Uh, S was a sphere, B was the open unipole. Um, so phi of A was contained in this ball. Uh, so it's quite trivial with, uh, with this holds here. And uh, since this, this is an intersection uh, of, an, of an open set, um, namely B, uh, with, uh, phi of a, uh, with phi of a union S, this is open in phi of a union S, right? So, but that means um, if, I'm, if I'm given here a y0 in phi of a, when uh, when I find a little ball around y zero, uh, which is still um, uh, uh, whose whose intersection with uh, uh, with phi of a union s uh, is still um, is still uh, in in phi of a right, so so. That means I find a delta zero such that all y, which are delta zero, delta zero close to, to y zero, uh, anyway, uh, cannot be in S. Now, if I take for this delta, I can say I'm looking for this delta without loss of generality. I'm just looking for delta less than delta zero, you know, because when delta gets smaller, I, I, I have to show less. So, uh, so, so I, I can actually just forget about uh, about this union S here, right? But when what is written here in the green version of this, um, uh, sorry, in the green version, um, this is just with uh, f tilde, uh, with f tilde uh, restricted to phi of a is uh, is uh, continuous, okay? And but I've, if if I restrict it to phi of a, when here it's just a, a composition of two two continuous uh, functions, right? Uh, psi and f zero wave were both continuous, and and so this uh, this upper version, this green uh, thing here, is actually is actually done, right? So now um, let's go. Uh, for the other thing, okay. So and the other thing was where y zero is in S, right? And then here I write the union S now. And then, um, but if y0 is in S, uh, then um, we have tilde of y0 uh, is, uh, is 0, right? So in this case, uh, I can just uh, delete this thing here. And I have here just the absolute value of f tilde of y, right? And, uh, and, um, 
f tilde of y. And uh, now maybe there are two cases where is one where uh, y lies in s. But when this is automatic, no, no matter how I chose, uh, I, no matter how I've chosen epsilon, right? If y is in s, when this is automatically true, <laughs> because this is the left hand side here is zero. So also, uh, also in this case, I can actually for therefore forget about uh, uh, about v s here, right? And then again, uh, since now y is no longer in s, uh, I can write really the definition of uh, of f tilde in this case right so if i can again uh, write what was written here and and so you see exactly this is this we have to show exactly this right okay and um now let's show this now let's show this so to this end let y zero be in s and epsilon positive and now I use what I know already here about F0. Choose a semi-algebraically compact set B, subset of A, with absolute value of F0 if X is smaller than epsilon for all X in A without B. Okay. Um, yes, when... Um, when uh, when phi of b now and now I, I I try to get everything uh, you know uh, since here I'm I'm looking at uh, y in phi of a I I look now at phi of b of course phi of b is semi-algebraically compact uh, again R semi-algebraically compact right. By six one eighteen, right? Okay. That was just uh, images of k semi algebraic in, in in this case semi algebraic um, semi algebraically compact sets and uh, semi algebraic continuous functions are semi algebraically compact, right? That's what I use here. So I use it with k equal r, of course. Okay. So phi of uh, B is semi-algebraically compact and consequently uh, phi of A without B, you know, phi is a bijection, so that's certainly phi of A without phi of B, right? So, and so I get here actually that this is S union phi of A without phi of B. And that's open, of course, in... Um, uh, you know, because the complement of phi of b is, uh, so this is closed and because it's semi-algebraically compact and the complement of it is when open. So, uh, so this is open in S union phi of a, this is open in S in phi of a union S, sorry. And, um, thus there is, uh, um, um, there is a little ball uh, inside phi of a union s uh, there is uh, there is a delta a bigger than zero such that everything which is inside phi of a union s and which is at, at most delta distance from um, from uh, Y zero uh, is still uh, is still contained uh, here. You know why Y zero also note that Y zero of course uh, is uh, uh, is in S uh, and therefore is uh, actually here in this set. Okay, it's a bit confusing, but it's it's not hard. And then uh, so this um, so this. Uh, uh, set here, uh, yeah. So this set is uh, now. If if I look what what this means for uh, for a y which are actually in phi of a, well, y cannot be in S anyway, right? So <laughs> uh, 
Okay, so 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 I get also this inclusion, right? And um, okay, so so I I chose already uh, this delta, right? That's actually my my. So we are we are we are in the process of showing this, right? We had already. Okay, let me maybe. Uh, so we had a given uh, a y zero in S and an epsilon, right? And when we have shown or when we have chosen already the delta, right? And the delta fulfills this. And now um, we let y be in phi of a, right? Uh, such that this is true, okay, and then um, we have to show this now. But when y is in uh, phi of a, but not in uh, phi of b, right, because uh, because it is in this set, so it's yeah, it's in phi of a without b, right? Because of this inclusion here, so y is in phi of a without b, and thus psi of y is in uh, a without b. Hence, uh, f zero. Uh, uh, hence, uh, uh, the absolute value of f zero of psi of y is uh, smaller than epsilon um, exactly as as desired you know because um, yes because we have for all x in a without b right in particular for this psi of y we have that this is smaller than epsilon okay this shows the continuity of f tilde. Okay. Um, okay, for all uh, uh, yeah, it's, so now I know that f tilde and g tilde are continuous. And um, yeah, now we can uh, apply the way of inequality on f tilde and uh, g tilde. So because for all y in phi of a we have obviously this. Right, um, and uh, and all together we have, uh, of course, for s, uh, for y and s, this is trivial because both equations are satisfied. Okay, so when we have this, and when we can apply, since phi of a union s is k semi algebraically compact by 6, 2, 3, we get from a Voisevich inequality 6, 2, 2. And n in n and a constant c non negative with for all y in phi of a union s, uh, absolute value of g tilde of y to the n is less than or equal c times absolute value of f tilde to the y. Right? In particular, we obtain uh, for all uh, y in phi of a, uh, but this is true, which means that for all x in a, this is true exactly as desired. Yeah, that's it. Thanks a lot uh, for listening and hopefully see you next time. Thank you. Goodbye.